Traumatic brain injury, TBI, impacts 2 million people per year. Professional athletes, military veterans, and first responders share their recovery stories after suffering severe PTSD and depression. Joe Rogan and Super Bowl MVP Mark Rippian, NFL running back Anthony Davis, and Ben Drebergen, Marine veteran and winner of CBS's 35th Survivor season, are featured in this enlightening documentary. Special Forces Green Beret Andrew Marr returned from his third deployment, a quietly broken man. The explosives expert suffered a multitude of concussions while detonating hundreds of blasts in Afghanistan. Unable to cope with his illness, he fell into a spiral of drug and alcohol abuse, even contemplating suicide at one point. When it was nearly too late, he met neuroendocrinologist Dr. Mark L. Gordon, who properly diagnosed his condition as a traumatic brain injury, also known as a TBI. So since then, Gordon has been helping veterans impacted by post-traumatic stress syndrome and traumatic brain injury through the Warrior Angels Foundation, founded by Adam and Andrew Marr and supported by podcast personality Joe Rogan, professional athletes Mark Ripien of the Washington Redskins Super Bowl, and Anthony Davis, running back USC Tampa Bay Buccaneers, candidly share their methods of coping with TBI and PTS, which they experienced from repetitive blows to the brain. Welcome to Love and Money Secrets TV. I'm your host, Dame Lillian Walker, and with us today we have Jerry Schur. Jerry is a two-time Emmy Award-winning director, and she has created this incredible film called Quiet Explosions. Joe Rogan and Tony Robbins just discussed this film, Quiet Explosions, and Joe Rogan himself was actually featured in the film. Jerry, I want to thank you for being on our show today. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's truly an honor to be on here, and I'm looking forward to this. Well, let's dive in deep into this subject matter. This is a, a really a silent killer. I'm so excited to have you on the show to talk specifically on this topic. It's like a pandemic of, of an incredible proportion that is hitting our society that no one is talking about. And it is one of the leading causes of death for Americans in the United States. One of the things that this film has uncovered is that there's an elevated risk for suicide, which is as high as 81%, according to Dr. Daniel Amen, he quoted that there's a higher incidence of suicide, even with a mild traumatic brain injury. And as we know, which you uncovered very beautifully and eloquently in this film, there are many people who are unaware that they have suffered varying degrees and multiple degrees of traumatic brain injuries. So why don't you take us down the road as to why it was that you decided to do this documentary and what was one of the personal revelations that you had with you and Alan, your husband, that 23 years ago you had no idea? I don't want to spoil the surprise, so I want to put the ball in your court now. <laughs> Thank you. Well, traumatic brain injury certainly is a huge uh, epidemic, and it is silent, and a lot of people don't know they have it, but it's in all walks of life, not just in athletes and sports and veterans who come back from the war, but also people who just have a car accident or fall off a ladder or a kid falls off a bicycle. Don't show up right away necessarily, but there's insomnia, there's migraine headaches, uh, people have depression, anxiety, their brain forgets things. It's, it's a myriad of situations. Situations. And why I decided to do the movie was I read the book, Tales from the Blast Factory, which was written by Andrew Marr and Adam Marr, two uh, military guys. I was floored. I was amazed. This book was just so, you know, groundbreaking about how he cured. He was healed by Dr. Gordon. I was fascinated by this. So I talked to this Green Beret, Andrew, and he looked at my work and said I had the rights to the film. And I told him I would do it under one condition. I wanted it to be a third military a third athletes and a third civilians since this was for the whole population. And we started the journey not knowing at all that my husband would be involved. My husband had had a heart attack at age 50 in Massachusetts where we lived and they just gave him another 15 years to live after the quadruple bypass. He ended up with a brain impairment. Some people call TBI, but say whatever. He had no short-term memory left at all. And he had many of the same symptoms as these other men and, and women in the movie. He had suicidal ideation, depression, and so on. Well, halfway through the film, 
overwhelmed Dr. Gordon. Dr. Amon said, I think we could help Alan. I think we could do something. And I didn't think that was possible after two decades. But in fact, we followed him with the camera and it did help him. And he is one of the main characters in the film. Wow. Isn't it interesting how God, the universe, how creation just very serendipitously dovetail what you do for a living in creating this film. That's fascinating how things were dovetailed where, I mean, you would have never thought because your intention wasn't really to have Alan even in the film and to have that all of a sudden come forth. Wow, what a blessing. What an answer to prayer. Alan suffered in silence for many, many, many years. So let's talk about one of the revelations in this film was that if you have been under, under general anesthesia for any kind of surgery, the chances are that you've probably suffered some degree of traumatic brain injury. Right, because enough oxygen isn't getting to the brain. And if oxygen doesn't get to the brain, parts of the brain are going to, you know, shut off and be missing. And, you know, the doctors are just happy they saved his life, so to speak. So every month when he would go back and say, I don't remember anything, they would say, oh, it's just the anesthesia. I was talking about the oxygen. The prison is deprived of oxygen sometimes in big, huge surgeries, long surgeries, 10 hours, eight hours, whatever. And the doctors just say, oh, you can't remember things because it, the anesthesia, it will wear off in a few months. But as the months go by, and as you never get your memory back, you know, you know, there's something really radically wrong. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit more about this, because one of the statistics that we unveiled in Quiet Explosions is that traumatic brain injury impacts 2 million people per year. It affects professional athletes, military veterans, first responders. Those are the most obvious. And in this film, of course, they share their recovery stories after suffering from severe PTSD and depression. What's not as obvious are the hundreds of thousands of people like Alan, who went in, had surgery, was under general anesthetics, and while they're in surgery, they are being deprived of oxygen. We all know that anytime that you go for six minutes or greater without oxygen, the brain starts to die, which if you are being deprived of oxygen while your body is in a stress state, typically your body needs more oxygen when it's in a stress state. Now during surgery, when you need the oxygen the most, your oxygen is being deprived, and that's why you have loss of memory, you have depression, you have all sorts of symptoms. Well, I thought it was very interesting that a man who was in his 70s was having the same exact symptoms as, say, a 30-year-old girl who had was a rape victim in the Navy and suffered severe PTSD, as was the firefighter who had hauled out all these dead bodies in 9-11 and was completely traumatized and unable to really function. It's interesting to see how the brain works regardless of who you are or, or what, you know, what you come from, what walk of life, because it affects everybody the same way and they end up with these terrible symptoms. I mean, luckily now there are ways to heal and that's what the movie unravels new groundbreaking methods that are helping everybody and alan and and sebi the firefighter and annie the rape victim so whether it's psychological or it seems emotional comes from that or whether you're in war and you bang your head a million times from in football either way you end up with a very similar situation which is called traumatic brain injury and those traumatic stress yeah so let's talk about some of the statistics are involved in a recent study dr amen just recently quoted saying that people who have suffered even a mild brain injury, and a mild brain injury is defined as an injury that leaves them dazed or confused. So you don't have to completely lose consciousness. You don't have to be bleeding from your head. Just be dazed and are confused. These people are 60% more likely to have died during the study period than those who did not have a traumatic brain injury. Plus, 91% were more likely to be hospitalized for psychiatric problems and 51% to have done less well in education. 52% were more likely to have needed disability benefits. And there are over 2 million visits to the ER that are directly as a result of TBIs every year. Yet, there are still hundreds of thousands of unreported incidents of traumatic brain injury simply because people think that maybe they, you know, they were in a car accident and yeah, they may have bumped their head, but they didn't really think it was severe or it didn't warrant their head being checked out or whatnot. And I must say that I think in many cases, even when you go to the ER, unless you say that you have a horrible headache or if you're, you know, if you have a gash in your head, they don't automatically test your brain to make sure that your brain is healthy and fine and that you're not bleeding and that you haven't had any damage. Well, that's true. And, you know, sadly, sometimes they test the brain, but the way they test in the hospital like Juliana our gymnast went after falling off uh, doing a gym stunt and then she felt you know felt so sick and she thought that her head was going to explode from the pain and they did you know 
some tests and said she was fine, sent her off with some Percocet. But you see, when Dr. Amen does a spec scan, he can actually see the blood flow in the brain, which is different from an MRI or a CT scan or a CAT scan. So it's very important. If you break your arm, you go to the hospital and you treat it and you look at it. If you have a head problem and your brain has, has some difficulties, you don't necessarily go and have your brain looked at. It's what we call now brain health. You need to focus and, and work on brain health. And then, of course, a lot of the mental and psychological problems will get better because you'll have the right hormones in your in your head and your brain and you will be functioning as a better human being as what your body is needing and used to. It's really true. It sounds like uh, it would be impossible but because in the past we've been told that, you know, whenever you have any kind of brain injury or brain trauma, that the brain cannot heal and that whatever brain damage you have is pretty much permanent. That, that was the conventional wisdom in the past. However, now we have plenty of evidence and tons of research to show otherwise and Dr. Daniel Eamon has actually built his business and his practice helping people actually recover from traumatic brain injury, just as Dr. Gordon has as well. And so the message is really for people who are suffering migraines, memory problems, concentration issues, mental fatigue, chronic pain, anxiety, insomnia, suicidal thoughts, balance problems, isolation. There's a whole list of symptoms that go hand in hand with traumatic brain injuries. And again, they can range from mild to you know, very, very severe. And that's, that's true. And also the other thing people want, would learn from the movie is that they can be helped with hyperbaric oxygen therapy, which is one of the therapies that both Dr. Amen and Dr. Gordon and Dr. Sammons promote and Dr. Share. And that's how our surfer was healed. He went into the hyperbaric chamber to have massive amounts of oxygen twice a day for like six to eight months. And he did recover. So that's another thing that I think is so exciting and calling attention to the fact that there are so many people playing different types of sports, which are the most obvious obvious people who can be injured in such a fashion where they actually have a traumatic brain injury. So surfers, you know, how many times have surfers been hit in the head by their own surfboards or by other surfboards? And, and the gentleman, I don't recall his name, who was in the Quiet Explosions film, he actually hit a rock, which is... Sean, yeah. Sean so Sean actually hit his head against a rock, which I can't even begin to imagine the level of pain that he endured, head and neck. But that is a more obvious injury. But I'm sure there are plenty of times, and I think he actually disclosed that, he had, that, that his scan revealed that he had multiple brain injuries, not one. He had the big one that brought him in, but he had ha had suffered others prior. And I think so many athletes are in that predicament. You know, how many gymnasts have not fallen off of a piece of equipment or landed odd, you know, doing whatever maneuver on the mats? And they're unaware that when they, even if you hit your head, I don't even know that there's such a thing as hitting your head gently, you know, on the floor, on a wall, against any other hard object. D Dr. Daniel Amen has been very clear that the brain has the consistency of jello and you have ridges on the inside of your skull that are spiny. And your skull, of course, is made of bone. When your brain is just moved abruptly, let alone slammed against anything, you're going to suffer brain damage, which is why babies who are shaken can die of you know, shaken baby syndrome. Yes, it's very prominently told that the brain is made of a soft jello type substance and it's encased in a very hard shell the skull and bone bone and of course like uh, AD Anthony Davis says in the movie it doesn't matter if you put a tank around your head to protect it it's not going to protect it because when you when you move that shaking jello and smash it into the skull any you know bad things can happen really I think eye-opening when you see all of these new methods that are being used on the 10 different characters and you you will learn and you know, I did a, a medical conference with Dr. Gordon about a year ago in Tucson, Arizona, and we were showing some of the doctors some of the footage. And many of the doctors who've been in practice more than 20 years came to me after and said, Jerry, I've been in practice 20 years, but I learned so much from your movie that I did not know. So I think it's very interesting that you can always learn. You know, every day is a new day, and they're coming up with new things. I mean, Dr. Gordon is a neuroendocrinologist, and he figured out the whole thing about replacing the hormones that are missing. So, you know, you never know know with medicine. You just don't know what's going to happen. And if we can give all these soldiers and these veterans a new way without just pushing major medical drugs that are, are making them kind of worse, actually, I think we've really accomplished something. Yeah, that would be a huge milestone for us as a society to be able to bring this to light and to actually start to take actions where, you know, the majority of the medical community would be on the same page of music, embracing and accepting and putting into action the effective treatments that we now need 
know without a shadow of a doubt we have conclusive evidence that it worked. I think one of the most astonishing things that you revealed, in my opinion, from from where I stand, was the fact that even though Alan had suffered this traumatic brain injury 23 years before, you know, he had had that massive heart attack, had open heart surgery, suffered as a result of being in surgery for eight to 10 hours, had suffered that injury. And it wasn't until last year that he began, a year or two ago, that he began the treatment with Dr. Gordon. And yet he has recovered in many ways. You know, he's your husband. So I would love to have you give us a before and after description of, you know, how he was before, what his mood was before, maybe what his stamina and memory were like, and what is he like now? Yeah, you know, it's very interesting living with someone and day by day seeing the reactions of what happens. Now, Alan did not get his memory back for sure. That that part did not get affected. I mean, he has his long-term memory from anything before the surgery, but he doesn't have short-term. So that if he watches Laura and Order, you know, yesterday, he could see the same Laura and Order tomorrow and he wouldn't have any idea that he just saw it. He might know he, he saw the show, but he wouldn't remember the show and he could see it again. Same thing if we go to the movies, which when we used to go before the pandemic, you know, we'd come out of the movie and we'd have a cup of coffee somewhere and he couldn't really remember what the movie was about. That has not really changed. What has changed dramatically, and this is how I noticed it the first time, Alan was a tax accountant and brilliant with finances and figures and so on. After he got really sick, he has an accountant who helps him with his taxes, but he has to prepare everything and get it ready and it takes, you know, a lot for him to do that. So while he was for Dr. Gordon, he would have all the papers laid out on the dining table, strewn all over for weeks, and he just couldn't pack it. He, he would take him forever and he would be migraine headaches and have such a difficult time and, until he could get it together to send to the accountant. The first year he went, he started the protocols. He was on them, I would say, maybe four or five months. And he said to me, I'm going to start the taxes. And I said, oh my God, thinking the table's going to be, you know, for six months, but you can't use it. So a few days later, I don't see any piles around. And I said to him, Alan, did you decide not to go forward with starting your taxes? And he said, no, I did it. It's all done. I already mailed it into our accountant in Boston. And I said, what? You know, is this possible? And he, in three days, he was able to do all that function that he had lost for years. So to me, that was like a huge revelation, like huge. And I was just so grateful wow. for any little thing that happens that's positive. I'm grateful. And so is he. Wow. That's really incredible to hear that he was able to go from one extreme to the other, you know, to, to go from, you know, really, it sounds like he had a lot of angst and probably a lot of stress and pressure because he probably couldn't think clearly, couldn't recall, couldn't organize, maybe couldn't concentrate. Mm -hmm. And now he was able to do it so efficiently and quickly that you couldn't even tell when he got it done because it was done in a zap. That's drastic. It was drastic. And I was telling my two daughters because they know, you know, they've lived with him all these years and they understand what he goes through. <laughs> and they said, that's just incredible. And they also noticed that he's less fidgety, like getting upset with something not going right. He would get very upset before quickly. But now he's pretty even keel and he stays calm. He's much, much more calm. And that's fantastic. So I know that he is tremendously better and we're extremely grateful for the protocol he's on with Dr. Gordon. It's going to be, he's going to be okay. I mean, he, it's been 24 years since the surgery and the doctors told him he would have 15 years after the surgery. That would be the best he could do. So he's outlived that. His quality of life is drastically improved now and he's probably healthier than he's been ever before since that surgery as a direct result of the treatment that he was able to get from Dr. Gordon. Literally, thank God for that. Yes. I mean, I don't say that anybody should give up their normal medications. I mean, certain med Alan is still on because, you know, he's an open heart surgery patient oh. and there are certain medications he'll be on forever but he also has all of the supplements and things that he takes from, from Dr. Gordon and that makes a huge difference. I wanted to read off here kind of a more comprehensive list of some of the, the symptoms behavioral mood muscular speech visual and so forth so that people kind of get an idea and then if you if you want to elaborate on any one of these as we go through the list by all means some of the cognitive symptoms that you can have are as we mentioned before migraines memory problems amnesia, inability to speak or to understand language, mental confusion, difficulty concentrating, difficulty thinking and understanding, inability to create new memories or inability to recognize common things, mental fatigue, chronic pain, anxiety, um, suicidal thoughts, balance problems, which oftentimes leads to other, other accidents that can re-injure re you, 
isolation, the tendency to isolate yourself and not wanting to be out in public, but be more of a hermit. So that's the first category is cognitive. Is there anything that kind of resonates here with you that you'd like to point out and maybe touch upon that was discussed either in the film or came into your awareness as a direct result of the film? Well, the uh, Marine, Ben Drybergen, who came back from war in Iraq, had to be isolated. He, His mother told me he went like a hermit and just stayed in a room and barely never came out for you know weeks and weeks. So that was what happened to him. I mean, he was going to kill himself and then he ended up really going into a coma for about a week and passing out. He had some really difficult problems, but he saw his partner die in his arm, buddy, and that just stayed with him. So he not only had the breaching and the, and the confusion from the war, you know, hearing all the blasts, but he had the emotional trauma as well. So he had like double and it took a very long time. He actually healed through music and he ended up playing the piano and he had never been taught to play the piano. He just started playing one day and his mother couldn't believe it. Like, he was playing Titanic and he couldn't read sheet music either. So, I mean, it was like a miracle, but he did heal. Yeah, that was really cool when they showed that in the film. I thought, wow, he uncovered, you know, a latent talent that he didn't even know he had. And to think that that would then help him heal something about the resonance of the music. Um, and it's probably stimulating a certain portion of the brain. Right. And you know, it's funny, Lillian, I, I watch a lot of medical shows that are on television. And recently one of them came up where somebody, you know, had never sung or, or played an instrument. And then all of a sudden, they had a brain problem and then the next thing you know they're, they're proficient in a musical instrument so I guess there are some things we don't really know about the brain that can happen in there that you know just this is what happened to Ben the exciting story about Ben is that he also was on Survivor the show and then ended up winning Survivor and that's kind of the big reveal at the end of the movie so people really get excited when they see that yeah I, I see that he was according to my notes he was the winner of CBS's 35th Survivor season yeah that's pretty exciting so obviously he made a full recovery because would there's no way he would have been able to pull that off otherwise you're right but you know he told me and i i really do believe this is accurate he said jerry i could not have won survivor if i hadn't had my military background he said i had an edge up on everybody else who was on that island because you know i had that focus in the military and i had to identify you know a ship by an outline and so he he felt like he just had a lot more up on everybody else he did he did you know his training there's a portion of the brain called the ras of particular activating system, which because of his training, certain things were on his radar that for the rest of the people on Survivor, they were scotomas. They were literally blind spots to them because they weren't trained to look for those things. He didn't have, he wasn't learning to or making an effort to. It was part of his automatic wiring. And so no wonder he won. It's incredible. Yeah. And it was really an honor when they called him back. The winners at war, they took 20 people that had won a million dollars to go back and compete for the two million. And uh, that was just the beginning of the this year. And he was on and he got to the last five. I'm so eager for people to really see the film, which is now available on DVD on both Amazon and Vimeo. Now let's talk also about the next category we have here is behavioral. And some of the behavioral changes that people suffer symptoms of are abnormal laughing, also known as hysteria, abnormal crying or unexpected outbursts of crying, aggression, impulsivity, irritability, lack of restraint, or persistent repetition of words or actions of domestic violence, rage, impulse control, impulsiveness, lack of empathy, and drug and alcohol abuse. I know that Dr. Amen talks about, uh, there's a statistic about a certain percentage of people who are homeless, there's a large percentage of them who have suffered traumatic brain injuries, which is what has led them to not only be homeless, but also to have drug addiction, alcohol uh, abuse, etc., and also all sorts of impulse control, which I think, unrightfully so, I think as a society, we tend to think that those people who have those impulse control issues that those are inherent personality traits, that people are just either rude or, you know, that there's something wrong with them, but not really recognizing there's a good chance that the root cause is a traumatic brain injury. Well, it is. And, and that's what happened to Andrew Marr, our lead character. Andrew was a functioning Green Beret who had a huge amount of responsibility. And once he got out of the army and was home, he would have these fits of crying, uncontrollable. And his wife told me he would be in the closet just crying his eyes out and, and no one could stop it. I mean, he just couldn't get a handle on what was going on in his, in his body, his mind, his soul, his, his brain. And he had huge fits of drinking, you know, massive amounts of alcohol. The alcohol happens pretty often with military people who have TBI. But also, the I did a huge movie on a lot of studies about 
homeless people. 50% of homeless people have mental illness. So it's, it's pretty aligned, you know, and then they end up on the street and then they're drinking or they're having drugs or whatever. But it's pretty common that these fits of uncontrollable laughter or crying happen with TBI. It's very, very common. We should also let you know that in the movie, we talk about transcranial magnetic stimulation, which Mark Rippon used to help the TBI in the brain. Yeah, I think that and the revelation of the hyperbaric oxygen chambers and how pressing oxygen into the body will help restore the entire body, especially the brain. It's like hands down, probably one of the separate from the supplements, which, you know, you need the certain nutrients to rebuild the neural synapses of the brain, but having the proper oxygenation also is another thing that will accelerate the healing of the body in its entirety, especially with the brain being at the root of it all. Absolutely. And I did not know when I started the project that Israel was the leader in the whole world for HBOT. They have more people in the hyperbaric chamber than any other country. They can put 200 people in at a time and they have 10,000 people on their waiting list. Wow. The U.S. has to get on the ball. We, we need to, just like we have gyms at every corner, we need to have hyperbaric oxygen therapy chambers on every corner. Not only will it drive the price down, but it will heal everyone and optimize everyone in ways that I think would astonish us all if we, if we pay attention and we start to implement this and start to take this type of care for ourselves and realize that it's more within people's reach. I don't think people really recognize, first of all, I think a lot of people have never heard of it before. Second of all, uh, once people hear about it, I, I think they may dismiss it as being a very expensive and extravagant treatment. And the reality is if you, if you buy uh, multiple sessions, it's typically doctors will prescribe you know, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 80 treatments. And so the cost per, per session drops down dramatically as you do that. And it's more within, I think, people's reach than what most people would even you know, recognize. Right. And Dr. Alan Shear in New York says in the movie that the way MRIs and CT scans were 20, 30 years ago is what's going to happen with, with uh, hyperbaric. That in 10 years, hyperbaric oxygen therapy will be like an MRI or a CT scan. People will know about it. People will have heard about it. It just takes time. Yeah. And that's what this film is doing. It's getting the word out there so that people recognize. Um, I actually had a friend who had a, an accident uh, riding an ATV and had a really bad um, leg injury. And so one of the things that the surgeon who, who um, stitched up her leg and her follow-up surgery surgeon told her was that she was going to, in order to heal and not scar on her leg, for her to get hyperbaric oxygen you know, therapy. So she did end up going, I don't remember exactly now how many treatments, this was back in 2015, and she probably had, I don't know, maybe 20, maybe 20 or 30 treatments. And much to her surprise, not only did she heal quickly, following year, when she went to her eye doctor to get her eyes checked, and mind you, she was in her 70s. Her ophthalmologist is expecting her eyesight to get worse every year because she's in her 70s. And he told her, oh my God, what did you do? Your eyesight is so much better. And she said, well, I had some hyperbaric oxygen therapy because of the accident that I had. But um, she was, I thought things looked better. And I was wondering why my glasses, her glasses weren't working. Her reading glasses weren't working for her anymore. And it's because her eyes were so improved. And I thought that's an outstanding Standing. It's totally amazing. I hear stories like that all the time. Really amazing what, what these things can do and how you can improve your life in so many ways, your health, your emotional being. Um, remarkable. Yeah. Oh and her skin also, it was like she already had nice skin, but my goodness, even her skin improved. I'm, I'm sure there's probably all sorts of other benefits that she realized that I don't know about. But I thought to improve your eyesight, eyesight when you're over 70, at any age, let alone over 70, and then for her skin to be glowing and just, just more revitalized, it's like, oh, and then needless to say, she healed faster without a scar, which I thought, wow, it's monumental. Yeah, I, I, honestly, there's so much out there that we, we can take advantage of. And I'm hoping that by people watching this film, their eyes will be open to the possibility possibilities and the hope that they can have a better life and improve the quality of their life. Absolutely. So let's talk about some of the other symptoms of a traumatic brain injury. We still have the category of mood, some of the symptoms of your mood being altered if you have a traumatic brain injury. And I want to clarify that the traumatic brain injury is not just someone who's been diagnosed with a traumatic brain injury, that you may have had a concussion, a mild concussion, or maybe you hit your head in some sort of, um, you know, whatever. It doesn't matter how you hit your head or had a strong jarring. Maybe you were, you didn't hit your head, but maybe you were hit from behind in a car accident and you were, you know, you had whiplash and maybe you were never diagnosed with a traumatic brain injury, but maybe just your neck was treated and your brain was neglected. So some of the 
mood symptoms are anger, anxiety, apathy, loneliness, uh, your whole body, blackout, out, dizziness, fainting, fatigue. I wonder how many people with fibromyalgia and other other fatigue-like symptoms, they're looking everywhere, but checking, maybe not. they're not checking their brain because they don't know to check their brain. Yes, we, we noticed a similarity with most of our characters, Kevin in particular, Kevin Fleck, who was also a Green Beret, he was always exhausted. He was so tired, he was so fatigued that he said to his wife, I don't think I can really work like a regular job. Like I just am tired all the time. I have to sleep. I have to go to sleep. So it's pretty common. The fatigue part happens. It happened with all of them, all of these characters just about. And that used to happen to Alan a lot. He would just go to sleep for hours on end in the daytime because he couldn't, he just couldn't function. He can't function. Yeah. I, I was actually, I told uh, Alan and um, I think I may have mentioned to you too. Actually at the time that we filmed the session with Dr. Amen and you know, Alan was being seen by him. And we also had the session where we filmed AD, Anthony Davis. I had been hit in 2017 by an Orange County Transit Authority bus. And I remember after I got hit, it was it was bizarre because even though I didn't break any bones, I, you know, I injured my neck, of course, and my back, and then I had the gash in my, my front leg. The brain fog was so, so thick. It's like for months, you can't think. It's like you're in this brain fog where you're like trying to clear your head, but you can't think, you can't concentrate, you can't read, you can't remember. I remember I had glasses and I would put my glasses on to read. I couldn't read anything. That's actually something that still to this day I have like just in August I spent over a thousand dollars for two pairs of glasses because I need various different degrees. My my eyesight still is changing and uh, it's a very frustrating thing and it's like you, you figure okay this too shall pass and then that incessant need to sleep. It's like a strange combination of not being able to sleep when you're supposed to go to sleep at night and then because your sleep patterns, your circadian rhythms are so out of whack, then, you know, you have, you, at some point you have to sleep and then you're just out and you could be out for who knows how long. And after a year, you're wondering, it's been a year, I should be healed by now. Revealed in your movie, you know, 23 years later, Alan, oh, I can't imagine suffering that long with all of those symptoms to finally get regulated and to feel better and to feel healed and to feel more clear-minded as a direct result of being on that protocol, you know, with Dr. Gordon. So there is hope, there is treatment, you can start living, you don't have to suffer in silence. And, and we just hope that each person who sees the film shares it with one other person because there's always someone around the corner who knows someone else who could benefit from this and maybe have a little more joy in their life and really get better. Yeah. We have a quietexplosions.com website which has resources on it for everybody. It has clips from the movie, all kinds of press, media. Just go to quietexplosions.com and you know have have fun, have enjoy, I and mean, you'll read so much in there. And, yeah, and then you can stream it on Amazon. Yeah, there's great information on the quietexplosions.com website. We're going to read the last, there's the last three uh, categories of symptoms are under muscular speech and visual. So we're going to go over them real quick. There's not that many left. For muscular, there's instability or stiff muscles, and then gastrointestinal, nausea or vomiting. Speech, difficulty speaking or slurred speech. Visual, blurred vision or sensitivity to light. Also common, persistent headache, temporary moment of clarity, bleeding, bone fracture, bruising, depression, loss of smell, nerve injury, post-traumatic seizure, ringing in the ears, or sensitivity to sound. I don't know if you want to comment on some of these, but it, it seems like a lot of these are, basically, if you think of the five senses, it, it, you know, when you get a brain injury, it's going to affect your five senses, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, feeling, etc. That's exactly right. And, you know, every one of the people in the movie has had little pieces of all of these things. You know, it's impossible not to have some of those symptoms, but sometimes mostly things are way, you know, if somebody has a migraine headache and they need to be in a dark room, they're co constantly concentrating on that and not concentrating, oh, I can't smell something. You know what I mean? It's whatever's the, the most poignant at that moment or the most difficult that they deal with. And each of the characters deals with different things. And we, tr we try to show different different symptoms th through each of them. Although you do see the common thread with all of them. Yeah. You know, it's funny because whatever your greatest pain point is, is where your attention and focus is going to go. So you might have like, for example, here we're, we're doing this broadcast and I have ringing in my ears normally. And because we're talking about it right now, I'm aware of it. As I focus more on what we're doing here on the broadcast, then it fades in the background where it's not as loud, it's not as obvious. But when I first had my traumatic brain injury, I didn't notice that 
as much. Sometimes I would, I would look up to see if maybe there was a light or something that was making that sound and I would walk around the house, but the sound, wherever I went, the sound went with me. So I realized quickly, oh, it's not, it's not something outside of me. It's something inside of me. So you kind of put two and two together, but that's not as big a deal because that's not as painful as, you know, whatever neck pain you have, back pain you have, whatever it is that, you know, you suffered as a result of your traumatic brain injury. So there's different, you know, levels of, I think, pain and awareness. And as you want heal one thing, then you're like, oh yeah, this has been around for a while, but it was not as significant until now that this is healed. Now I can tend to this. And the other thing I wanted to mention is that I know that for a lot of, the, the film didn't talk too much about this, but I know that one common shared feeling, if you will, that a lot of people who suffer from traumatic brain injuries is the sense of shame that comes from having the traumatic brain injury. Now, my, mind you, Andrew Marr, as a Green Beret, he was working, you know, doing what he was hired to do as a soldier. You know, he didn't do anything wrong. He was trained to do the work that he was doing, and he suffered multiple traumatic brain injuries from this. But when you walk away, come back home, and now you are suffering the consequences of having to live with a traumatic brain injury, and now you start realizing all the things that you can't do, and you start to recognize things that normally you should be able to do, but for some unexplained reason, you can't. And when you're not thinking as clearly, there's a tremendous amount of shame. Even though it's not your fault that you suffered that traumatic brain injury, I think that's part of the reason why people have the dark thoughts, the, the thoughts of suicide, the depression, the angst. You know, you don't want to admit that you don't remember things. You don't want to admit your shortcomings, if you will. You want to talk a little bit about that in your personal experience of dealing with all the people that were highlighted in this one? Of course. So the big thing about shame that happened in the movie, um, and it's probably hard to remember all this because there's so much in the movie, and yeah. most people tell me they need to see it two or three times, but Annie, our Navy gal, was shamed tremendously. I mean, I mean, this poor girl who was raped twice was told that she was mentally ill and put into a psych ward and she was so shamed and it wasn't even her fault and I mean it was horrific absolutely horrific I mean she had to leave the Navy without getting her degree the Naval Academy um it, it couldn't have been worse honestly uh so I think I think that we touched on it in that episode or in that mm -hmm. story mostly but you're right a lot of these Green Berets are these very you know big star football players, they don't want to admit, you know, that they have this big, huge problem. Yeah. So they keep it to themselves, you know, they the isolation, they hide, it, they hide it away, you know, especially that Mark Rippon. But of course, they feel some shame, of course. But I think it's Annie's story where we mostly talk about it. Yeah. And I think, you know, the, the fact that, you know, in her, in her case, and happens to, I guess, uh, many of the people who've had the traumatic brain injury, it's like you have one injury. And in her case, you know, she was a rape victim. And to think, you know, the most, it's horrific enough that it happened once. But now, because she had a traumatic brain injury, now she's more apt to have it happen again because she doesn't have all of her faculties. She can't protect herself as well. She can't, she's not of sound mind the way she was prior to that happening. So now it makes her susceptible. And I, I mean, I was aghast when I saw the film and I saw that it happens to her again. I can't imagine not only what she went through, but her poor mother having to, to, to experience that and her father and then having to deal with the school and how poorly the school, you know, the way the school handled it and dismissed it and minimized it. And of course they're dismissing and minimizing it because they don't want to take responsibility. They don't want any liability. And so that just adds insults to injury and makes it difficult for the person who is suffering this. Yes, it was very difficult for Annie and her family. And you know, it's a very interesting story. When I met Annie in Texas, I, I brought Annie here in LA and I did a lot of her, her filming here, but then I went to Texas to meet the family and also to film her when she got her master's in business MBA from uh, Texas, University of Texas at Arlington. But she told me many times, she said, look, Jerry, I've been interviewed by CNN. I've been on CBS. I've, I've been all, on all the news channels and, and, you know, coverage, media, everything. I'll tell you the truth. You can talk to my dad, but never will my mother give you, talk to you or give you an interview. She has never given an interview in all the years I've gone through this. And I thought to myself, I am going to get an interview from this <laughs> You don't think no. <laughs> no is not in your vocabulary. <laughs> exactly. So, and I, I needed it. You know, I wanted it. First of all, I don't have hardly any female characters in the movie. And, I, I, and it was very important to me to hear what the mom had to say. So then I said to my cinematographer, when we got to her house, go do your thing with the lighting. I took Annie's mom separately and we talked. We just had a cup of tea and we talked for a long time, just as two women mm -hmm. talked about my husband and what had happened. And by the end of our talk, 
she agreed to do anything I wanted. And she gave me an amazing interview. So let's talk about mothers because you're a mother, I'm a mother. One of the things that I've noticed is that sometimes kids, I don't really know what the numbers are on this, but it's not uncommon for young children not only to bang their heads, you know, in their playground and so forth, but there are some kids who out of, you know, I don't know if it's temperament or if there's something else going on, but they literally sit in their beds and they bang their heads against a wall, especially children who have autism, ADD, ADHD, and so forth. And so every time that kid is hitting their head against that wall, and they're usually doing it because they're angry, those are multiple concussions that they are giving themselves. And so it's no wonder that those kids have impulse control issues. And the parents think that the, you know, the child is unruly. And of course, the kid has behavioral problems. But I think a lot of mothers should be watching this film. And if you start to see that some of these symptoms are pervasive in your child, you know, the sooner, I mean, the, the good news is that because they're still young and all the neurological functions of the brain haven't been fully formed. It takes up until age 25 for that to cement itself in place. The good news is that they're going to have a faster recovery than people who are over 25 that are subject to all the perils of a traumatic brain injury. But I think this is something, you know, kids fall off of monkey bars and hit their head when they hit, you know, the ground or jump off a swing hit their head, you know, on a tree or because they miscalculated. There's so many, you know, one-off instances that people don't realize that there's damage that's being done, but there's a solution. You know, that doesn't have to stay as a permanent circumstance. Well, you're right. I think it's very important for moms to watch this uh, for children like, you know, moms and dads. I mean, everybody says this is a movie for men, but I don't really agree. I think it's a movie for any human being who has a brain. I mean, the vice president of Disney saw the movie and he loved it. And he said to me, Jerry, this is not Disney fair necessarily, but I think I want to go get my brain scan right away after I saw your movie. And anybody with a brain needs to see this movie. Absolutely. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. If the president of Disney is saying, maybe I should have my brain checked, you know, it makes us kind of think, you know, wonder because if you're getting your teeth checked twice, twice a year, and if you go get an annual exam for allegedly, I'm going to say your entire body because we now know that the brain is neglected. Everything else might be checked. You get check, check your eyes every couple of years, your ears, your teeth every, you know, every six months and so forth. But really, we don't really get a thorough brain check. And really the only way to, without a shadow of a doubt, have a true snapshot of the true condition of your brain is to have a brain scan. I think that's, that would be a very wise investment. It would save people, I, I think, a lot of grief. And it probably will increase, it will pay for itself in the increased well-being and health and just the focus and concentration and energy that you're going to have is going to make you a better, more happy, productive member of society because you're more whole and complete. Yes, you're absolutely right. And I just felt so excited when I saw my brain scan and I saw, you know, the, the brain itself. I mean, I don't like to put anything in a film unless I understand it and do it myself and know, know what it is. So I did that whole experience with Dr. Amen before I even put it in the film. And, but you know, I had this funny feeling that I had a really good brain because first of all, I take very good care of myself and eat nutritiously and work out perfectly, walk every day, get the right amount of sleep, take vitamin D and so on and so forth. But I just had this feeling, my mother was 94 and she had a really perfect brain. I mean, she could, she knew everything till the moment she was passing on and she had, a, you know, she had so much going for her and she taught school till she was 80. And of course I have those genes. So I had this funny feeling, you know, that I had a good brain and it was so exciting to me and so enlightening when Dr. Amen looked at my scan and said, confirm yeah. Oh my God, you have the same brain like my mother and his mother's brain is in his book because it's such a great perfect brain and really healthy. And he said, it's so healthy. It's like a 40 year old. And I was, I was like, I just had a feeling, you know? <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. So the brain in the movie, that's Anthony Davis on one side, and then it's, it molds and meshes into the healthy brain. Uh -huh. That's my brain. Oh, that's fantastic. So they used Anthony's brain showing his, and then the healthy brain is your brain. I didn't know that. I know. Yeah. Oh, that is absolutely wonderful. By the way, if you know that I did receive the DVD and thank you for signing it. I also received your postcard and thank you for, it was so fun working on this project. And Oh, you are such a fantastic help. I mean, I am so grateful to you being in Orange County with us, helping us when we filmed, helping us with AD recently uh, for the press. You, you know, you've been just, you know, jack of all trades and terrific. And I'm, I'm so grateful that 
Debbie put us together, um, you know, I feel like it's very serendipitous how people meet and how they get together. And all the people that come into my life, I know it's for a particular reason. Yeah. And, you know, I'm just so thrilled that you're promoting and helping people to know about our film. And it's wonderful. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to having also AD. He's going to be on the show, too. He, um, he wrote a book called Kickoff Concussion, which I guess in 2021, it's going to be released. It's not available yet. I just got it because he just gave it to me when we did the Fox News with Denver last week. Yeah, this is, is really fantastic. Thank you so much, Jerry. Thank I'm you, Lillian. I'm so honored to be on your show and I'm so grateful. And thank you for everything. You've been just such an angel. You're quite welcome. And I can't wait to see more of your films. My goodness. Um, I remember the first film that I saw, the Live, La Live Life series that you did, um, that Discovery Channel had you tour all over the world in a cruise liner. Never forget when you, you know I was able to see the premiere of that in your incredible home theater home. And that was an incredible series. And it touches upon all the different alternative modalities of healing. And so for you to go from that to now to this, which is more specifically about traumatic brain injuries and brain health, I think is, is just phenomenal. So I look forward to you doing, you know, more projects along these lines and anything I can do to help on, sign me up. Oh, thank you so much. You're so kind. You've been just such a such a help. I, I really appreciate it. You know, it's it's a village. We need a whole village to make a movie. There's so many people involved. And I'm just grateful for all the wonderful people that have come on board for this project. Uh, it's, it's a fun endeavor. Well, thank you, you guys, for tuning in, tapping in, turning on to Love and Money Secrets TV. This has been our wonderful guest, Jerry Schur, two-time Emmy Award-winning director of the film Quiet Explosions. Do check it out on Amazon. Go to quietexplosions.com. You can get the film there you can also get it on vimeo also visit jerry's website she's got some really cool resources and information on jerryshire.com you are also an accomplished author of several books so i want to point people towards that as well thank you again jerry and as i always say to my friends and gems ciao for now thank you <laughs>